So I'm here with Dean Baptiste. In 2014, he became the first black British solo comic to be nominated for the Edinburgh Comedy Award Best Newcomer Prize at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival for his debut, Citizen Dean. His second stand-up show, Reasonable Doubts, was again met with huge critical acclaim. His 2017 show, G.O.D. Gold, Oil and Drugs, examined the links between power, money and religion. He wrote and played the main character in the BBC thrick- uh, sitcom, Sonny D. He created the satire show, Bamus. He has all the TV credits you can imagine, Live at the Apollo, etc, etc. He is the host of the acclaimed podcast, Dan Baptiste Questions Everything. His new show, Bob Squire, will run from the 14th to the 27th of August this year in Edinburgh. And his special, where he talks about race, uh, Chocolate Chip, will be out the 4th of August. Yes. And there's actually much, much more, but... <laughs> let's, 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 we'll stick to the bullet points. And also, obviously, people won't remember this shit otherwise, so make sure... <laughs> Well, I'm going to have to hand it over in bio. But, you know, pleasure to be here, Reese. Thank you very much for having me. No problem at all. Thank you for coming. It's all good. Yeah, so this podcast is just where a new comedian interviews established, successful comedians to find out what's happening and stuff. So You already you... won me over with that. <laughs> established and successful. <laughs> Don't hear that much from the new guys, so thank you very much, Reese. Of course. <laughs> Ask away. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, the first time I've seen you doing live was with Russell Hicks, where you're doing that concept show where we're both on stage, and I was yeah. very impressed. Uh, no, it was it was a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for coming as well. Uh, mm-hmm. as, a, as a fellow comic, it's always good to get support from the uh, from the the, com- the community. Um, but yeah, it was always a pleasure working with Russell as well. Mm-hmm. I think he's a amazing improviser uh, and a massively charismatic uh, comic. And um, yeah, always happy to work with him. We go way back, so it's all good. I'm ready to join his cult. If he ever starts one, he's got member number one. He can charge whatever fee he wants, and I'm there for. So <laughs> I've got a healthy appreciation if you, for if him. You, exactly. <laughs> if you, I think if you, if Russ, what Russell wanted to, he could. I just don't think he has. He is inclined to give a fuck about that many people at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take it the whole way back then. Um, from our research, it was 2008, roughly, where you started. Uh, well, do you know what I'd say? Cumulatively, I think it. As the first gig I ever did, which was a comedy gig, was in 2006, on October 26th. And basically, I had my first breakup and I had a lot of free time in the evenings, <laughs> and, uh, surprisingly. And a friend of mine said he used to go to a comedy club. It was uh, Kojo's Comedy Fun House, which used to be uh, just off of... Um, what's it? It's Oxford Street? Yeah, it was Selfridges on Oxford Street. So just off of... Across the road, there's a shop, a place called Binney Street, and there's like a burger and lobster there now. But it was like, like a bar, downstairs bar, called Corks. And uh, it used to be there every Sunday. And I used to go there and watch because I still, like I always loved comedy, but the idea of doing it and being a stand-up comic was never really entered into my head. And uh, so a friend of mine was just like, you know what? Uh, my friend's funny. You, sh- you should put him on. And Coach was like, fine. He's got two weeks to get some shit together. So my friend Alwyn's like, yeah, I did it for you, bro. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember you asking, but <laughs> fair enough. But it was cool. So I started, so that's what kind of started, started the writing process then. And uh, it was a good gig. And then I probably, between 2006 and 2008, I probably did about like a handful of gigs. And I was just winging it because I was like, someone, I didn't know anything about comedy in terms of like how you get gigs, uh, what you do on stage, how long you're supposed to do on stage, what you're supposed to accept, what you're not supposed to accept. So I was just winging it. And then about 2008, I kind of left it. I was working a job and I was like, that was fun. And it may be a fun hobby, but uh, I'm going to get a proper job. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. and, it got, and then 2008 was when the credit crunch happened. Because my, my whole thing was about any kind of creative pursuit. Because I always loved, like, obviously, performing, entertaining. It was like, that's a fun hobby to do. And I enjoy doing it for friends and family. And it's a great icebreaker. And it's part of my personality. But, like, as I said, as the first black British person, like, other than Richard Black. So Richard Black was, like, the last person I saw who was, like, famous for being funny. Mm. And in the early noughties, like, he got crucified by TV. Like, people made him look like a prick. And I was like, well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I don't want that to happen to me. And so I was like, well, it's a fun thing to do. And then around 2008, when the credit crunch happened, I was like, oh, so you're telling me that if you do a normal job and you save your money into a pension, you still won't have that pension when you finish working? I was like, that's fucking insane. And that was like the last, I suppose, mental uh, barrier I put on myself to do comedy. So, yeah. Luckily, I was also getting fucked at work as well. <laughs> <laughs> getting fucked over at work. I had a horrible job uh, working with horrible people. You had, uh, a, you had a string of horrible jobs from my Yeah, I've had a discipline at every job I've ever done. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a work person. I've got, I've got a lot of personality, personality <laughs> traits which do not so, so, suit the paradigm of working in an office. Because if I, for example, I question authority if what you say doesn't make sense. I also will... 
don't respect hierarchy on the basis of tenure. Like, if you're <laughs> going to be in charge of me, you have to know what I'm doing more than I know what I'm doing because I just think that's logical. And mm. I feel like everyone feels like that. I don't think mm. I'm unique in that. I just think most people at some point in their life, I don't know what point happens, in the same way that everyone has dreams about a job that they enjoy, mm. people bury that or internalize it and they kind of slot into this thing of being like, well, I'm just going to basically be a sycophant and suck as much corporate dick as I can to get where <laughs> I need to be or I'm going to be a friend. Mm. And I'm going to. for me, it's just, I just find the whole process kind of soul destroying. And I would just see things like, the one job I used to work at in, um, on a job board, like advertising jobs, mm. When I started this job, it was great. Like I found like 80% of the people on my team were on Coke. <laughs> my line manager, it was, it was, it was so great. Like, and the thing with me, Reese, I, I, I want to make it very clear, yeah. I don't have any delusions about me being funnier than anybody in the world. But what I truly believe is, yeah, that I am a normal person surrounded by so much crazy shit. <laughs> and I'm like, are you fucking serious? And then and people just look at me like, I'm the crazy one. I, I'm serious. So I work in this co company. I'm there for like a month. In the space of a month, my line manager goes to rehab. My <laughs> team leader goes to rehab. And I'm fuck. My team leader showed me a picture of him on holiday with his girlfriend in Spain, where he met some Nigerians who were trafficking coke from Colombia to Spain, then to England. So he's on holiday in Spain. He's like, dying. Look at this, mate. I was so coked up. <laughs> I pissed myself. I'm like, no way. He's like, you don't believe me. So he showed me at work, he showed me pictures of himself pissing on himself because he's cocked off his face. Like, I don't know what other people was like on job training is. He's telling me one time I got so much coke with a nurse and there was a dog involved and a glass table. I'm like, where the fuck am I? Where am I? So surprisingly, he has to go to rehab to get clean. My, my line manager, she puts me on a disciplinary because she's like, you're not really doing the job properly. I'm like, well, no one showed me how to do the job properly. At one point, she is so drunk in a pub once. Have you? I bet you've never heard someone say to a woman, "You're flying low." I don't know what it means. <laughs> you your zippers undone. <laughs> you, like men sometimes your zippers undone. <laughs> it like, oh, yo, <laughs> I've never seen a woman with her flight undone and people being like, "Your vagina is showing. You have to zip up your jeans." <laughs> so she goes to rehab, and I'm like, "What the fuck?" Anyway, I left that job. <laughs> I've, it's, and then I work, I'm work so, and the funny thing is about the last job I did before I did comedy yeah, was that I was like Dane you need to be focused you're getting older in your 30s you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be in your 30s soon you need to focus on a, on a career my god I don't know how people believe in manifesting but, <laughs> but whatever I did was the opposite <laughs> people were like fuck you like I had a manager my manager just to show you my manager was on The Apprentice mm. so that's to give you an idea, insight into her managerial <laughs> skills I'm working selling advertising. And at one point in a meeting, she was like, oh, people don't look at adverts anyway. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, I feel like that's probably true to an extent, mm. but you shouldn't say that. If you were like a sergeant in the army and there's all these Lance Corporals and privates, you're like, well, most of you are going to die anyway. Fuck <laughs> wars, for, wars for profit. You'd be like, you probably, that's not the motivational speech they need to hear. Yeah. So that would be the kind of thing I would deal with. So I was on another disciplinary and I just, yeah, I just think I got to the point where I was thinking about like the economy and all the things because I, I guess you overthink things. And I think when most people want to pack in like their job or pack in something to pursue something they want, mm. you'll, you'll procrastinate for whatever reasons you you you, you want to because you're like, well, I, have no, I don't know what I'm doing with this shit. But it just got to the point where I basically was like, oh, do you know what? Fuck it, I quit this job. Mm. It just got, it was, it was like one thing that happened where I was like, I went away on holiday. My manager gave away one of my sales leads to somebody else. Mm. Everyone on the team knew this. And when I came back, she stole it. And then she's like, you can fucking have it back. Fuck you then. And I'm mm. like, don't talk to me like that, please. Mm. And after I said, don't talk to me like that, I got pulled into an office. And then my manager was trying to give me an Alan Sugar and like, you're aggressive <laughs> and you know, your conduct and all this shit. And I was just like, ah, oh, fuck you. I quit in it. <laughs> and you no, know, I don't know how many people get the opportunity to say, Fuck you, I quit. Normally people be like, I'm giving my notice. <laughs> <laughs> I have four weeks notice, so I'm going on garden and leave. Like that's yeah. how most people leave jobs. Yeah. I was like, fuck this and <laughs> fuck you, I'm done. And I tell you that the uh, weight came off my shoulders and my chest. I, 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 I've only felt that very few times, but I, I encourage anybody to do that because <laughs> trust me, it sounds mental, but most people do not even know how to respond if you tell them I quit. Because mm. as soon as you say you quit, the power's gone. Mm. And I think that's the mentality that has carried me even throughout comedy, which is why I told that long story. But yeah, 2010, I was like, ah, oh, fuck this. Because even when they, I had like an exit interview and they were like, well, there were points in time and I was like, that didn't happen. And they were like, well, what do you think? And I was like, all right. 
I just work at the office. And it, so, I, so the office was like open plan like this, like glass and stuff. Yeah. So you'd be at your desk there. I'd come in here and you'd see me going, nah, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> just walk out. And um, yeah, I was like, right, now time to just do. So then before I did comedy, I did like a creative writing course. So I'd done comedy before, obviously, but I was like, mm. I understand it, but I want to understand stagecraft. I want to understand like just how to do the whole thing properly rather than wing it. Because when I was like looking at other comics and comics you admired or comics that I saw had a profile, one of the commonalities I saw was that a lot of people went to either stage school and or people had like studied theater and performance. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm not going back to fucking stage school. <laughs> I can't handle that. Pete Tag of drama. Yeah, here we go. yeah, yeah. I can't handle a drama people. I just don't have to stand for it. <laughs> Not after the shit I've experienced here. I, I can't express to you the things I've seen in workplaces. <laughs> that people are like, what? And I'm like, I'm fucking serious. I had, I remember I had a, a, t uh, a director, a commercial director of my, of my team, other teams, and... I'm telling you, on the 1st of December, it was Christmas for him. He was not in the office. There was a pub across the road. <laughs> if you wanted to ask him something corporate, you better go to the pub because he ain't in the office. And more power to him. Fuck it. Because <laughs> nobody gave a fuck. Mm. That, uh, it was, that job was so funny because then I found out when I left it, there was loads of people that were still hitting their target when I was missing my target. And I was like, well, how come I can't do it? And I found out that like, Years later, people were doing stuff that they were renewing contracts that people had agreed to. So they were like mm. revolving the money and stuff. So there was like, I, when I was away, there was like a massive clawback of money from the company mm. and they had to clamp down on people who would like, all the commission they had earned, mm. they had to pay it back. So I guess I've always been someone that has to go my own way as well. And I'll tell you why about that story as well. So anyway, I did an improv course and that was fun. And then at the, I was at like a comedy school and the comedy school is like a charity, but also a stage, a school where they do outreach. They'll do workshops mm. in like prisons and they do workshops with like kids and at-risk youth, but they also do these improv classes. Mm. And I told them that I'd done comedy before and they were like, well, how seriously were you taking it? And I was like, well, I did a few gigs between 2006, 2008. And they were like, it's not very fucking seriously. Mm. So they were like, do this course, we'll do a showcase. And at the end of that, we'll give you a list of like open mic nights and gigs you can go to. So I did that course, it was about six weeks. Did a showcase at the end. Uh, yeah, they gave you the list. And then, yeah, career started in earnest. And from there, yeah, it's from like, yeah, 2011, around August. Mm. So I'd say around 2011 is probably when I actually did comedy. But mm. when you accumulate all the years, then yeah, maybe 2010 onwards. But yeah, 2011, yeah, was when it when it started, I guess. And you just went from from the get-go? You were like, okay, this has to be the career now that I can't go back yeah, to the Yeah, I mean, I tried to go back because the thing is when you have a job in comedy, it's very frustrating. Like if you live in London, for example, like, say you have a job, when you finish your work at like maybe five, well, it's supposed to be nine to five, but most people finish at 5.30. Well, you know, being fucking scammed, by the way. <laughs> They're not being contracted to do that. So most people hang around in the office till half mm. five, quarter to six, maybe half six. Mm. But comedy gigs don't normally start until eight. Mm. So you can fuck around and hang out in central London waiting for the gigs to begin, mm. which is a ball ache, I imagine, for people. Mm. Or you can go home and have a change and whatever, get your mm. material together. But that commute home and back out, by the time you're ready to go to a gig, mm. you're like, oh. So I did that for a bit and tried to do that with a job. And I was like, I can't do this, man. Luckily, my other company is so incompetent, they continue to pay me. When I <laughs> Not too much, but enough that was like a, a redundancy. So the fates had conspired in my favor in that way. <laughs> and then they were like, I was just coked on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I remember we had one, there was one guy working for HR and he was not great. <laughs> he, was, he was not a great human resource person, as none of them are. Because I worked out very early on, and I think most people don't work this out. Like, if you know if you have a grievance, you go to HR. Mm. Well, who the fuck does HR work for? <laughs> so if I want a company and HR go, there's a problem with your somebody in the company, I go, well, you can tell them to fuck off or you're fired. <laughs> So you wouldn't do anything, would you? Because HR's like, it's a problem. You know, I can solve this problem by firing you. Mm. And who are you going to go to for discrimination? <laughs> no one. So shut up. <laughs> it's like when they go, uh, we need to investigate the corruption in the police. Who shall do it? The police. <laughs> no. Our findings are everything is fine. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> you're doing great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's very fine here. And they, go, you, they go, are you sure? And they go, yeah. By the way, I resign. <laughs> so it's just, it never, it's just a weird thing. Um, so. Yeah, I started to do a job, but I started doing comedy. I was like, yeah, this basically has to work. And I, I kind of want to put myself in that position where there was no plan B. And uh, yeah, just tried to hit the ground running the uh, second time around. Mm. And um, yeah, it was a good run. Uh, was there fear initially when you didn't have the support of like the jo the day job, basically? Um, or there, were more, sort of there were more gigs, but just they weren't really that well paid because mm. it was open mic. And open mic is obviously um, quite a saturated thing. And I, I'll tell, I can tell most comics as an experienced comic, 
But making it through open mic is probably one of the hardest parts of the process. Mm. So just getting through that or holding fast onto that to start getting graduating from uh, open mic to paid gigs is a big jump. So if you can do that, like it's a massive achievement. And uh, I hope that it uh, makes it feel worth it because I remember the first time I got paid 50 quid for a gig. Mm. That feeling, <laughs> I've been paid exponentially more than that. <laughs> but that first time you get 50 pound for a gig, you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> there you go, skyrocket. Yeah, yeah. You're like, um, I think you'll find it's professional <laughs> comedian. What can I change on? <laughs> <laughs> professional comedian. Getting Thank on the you very much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. basically, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be pre-approved for some gold credit cards soon. But yeah, it, it's um. So that was, I guess, that was the first obstacle. Was like, uh, kind of graduating from open mic, and uh, and how did you go about doing that? Just um, I guess gigging the shitload. But I, I think that I also had experience whereby a lot of my earlier gigs were on what's referred to as the black circuit. Uh, so I was almost able to shuttle both circuits where I'd be playing rooms with predominantly white people, playing rooms with predominantly black people. The thing about black and white circuits is that it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, these rooms are exclusively one group of people that identify as a particular race. It's more about, I would say, more the topicality and the themes that you might hear more often in a uh, black circuit room versus like a mainstream room. Because if you go on the mainstream circuit, you might be able to do five minutes about wanking. If you do more than 30 seconds about wanking in a black room, they'll be like, maybe you need to go on a wank and get the fuck off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here for this. It's, uh, and it's because the black circuit is quite unique in that it arose out of, like in the early noughties, a lot of uh, hubs for black culture, like musical venues and stuff like that kind of closed down, particularly in London, loads of them closed down. So what happened was a lot of uh, the nights promoters, nightclub promoters migrated their like mailing lists and audiences mm. from uh, clubbing culture to comedy culture and the way it would work is that they would have a comedy or mixed bill night and then they would have an after party that would follow that mm. and so you were trying to perform for people who are like this is nice but I came here for women <laughs> not for this man's scathing <laughs> scathing <laughs> observations about government corruption like so it was kind of learning how to manage that but um, it was beneficial because it meant that like some of those rooms would be harsher which would give me a much steeler resolve to deal with like playing more mainstream rooms I should say mm. Um but I guess it it was also for me, I guess the drive was A, I wanted to make sure I did like the creative writing so I knew what the fuck I was talking about. A lot of research. I spent a lot of time reading up about British history, about Britain's history with race relations, because I what I didn't want to do is try to too much to be a mimic of the African American comments I looked up to, like the Chappelle's and the Chris Rocks, and mm -hmm. I didn't want to be like just to be doing a port homage to them. So I wanted to make sure I did a nuanced research about British history. British history in terms of race relations and the like, and, and also British identity in general, because I also didn't want to have a uh, very generic view of, you know, white Britons and, mm -hmm. you know, or in general as well. So I just had to do a lot of that uh, research. And to be honest with you, a lot of the barriers I came up with, I came up against were what pushed me to have to develop much more uh, unique material mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, as I said, as the first black British person to be nominated for an award in Edinburgh by myself, I'm not the first black British comic in the UK, but very mm -hmm. clearly a lot of people had gone there and not had much success or not been recognised. And the general consensus amongst black British comedians was, well, fuck Edinburgh, it's not for us. Mm -hmm. And I, the first time I went there, I think I'd gone there just to like check it out, like for a week, and I ended up being on like a BBC showcase because someone had seen me in like performing in London. So that's how I got on there the second time. I didn't really plan on going for that long and then ended up being in the Muse Moose final. So that's why I ended up going to Edinburgh and stuff as well. So I just kept finding myself in these places where I just didn't see anyone looking like me in these spaces and was dealing with, like I said, a lot of, uh, so a lot of criticism from critics that were trying to play down the work I was doing. And most importantly, no agent gave a fuck about me. That's I had hard. to make that very clear. Like basically, the club I probably used to play the most was up the creek because I used to live, I live in Lucian and that was the nearest club to me. And that's probably one of the only places that would give, other than Comedy Cafe, most act, people weren't really putting on that many black British acts or their their literal policy was, we've got one, two on the same bill. But it'd be like looking into a mirror for some people. Like they, they, they were like, it'd just be, it would just be like an echo. So my manager at the time, or, or my manager, my ex-manager, I should say, used to run a night on a Thursday. We, you heard of the Blackout? Mm, the gong so, show. So yeah, the Blackout before it was a gong show was just like a new act at night mm. and everybody would do five minutes and there'd be judges and they'd decide who goes through to a final. 
And the first thing is, for some reason, some of these judges would be like, not him. And I'd be like, but why? And that happened so many times mm. that in the end, they said, oh, do you know what? You've come second like three times. We're just going to say, fuck it. Give it a go for a 10 minute on a Friday. See how it goes. And it went so well that basically <laughs> I was just doing uh, the 10 minutes, the open spot at the creek for like 18 months. And then oh. sometimes if someone dropped out, I'd end up getting a 20. Um, and I was able to kind of work up towards 20s because the only other place that put on a lot of black acts was a uh, top secret comedy, mm. which is why they're probably one of the, as well as up the creek, probably one of the best comedy clubs in London. So as that went on for time, what my manager was also doing was that she was inviting industry like agents to come to the nights mm. to scout for new talent. And they'd be like, yeah, nah, nah. And one of them said uh, that we already have a black act. We don't need to. And I probably shouldn't say who they are, but I don't give a fuck. It was Lisa Thomas. So, or an agent from Lisa Thomas mm. said that. Uh, and to be honest, I didn't really give a shit because at the time, I'd obviously, like I said, I'd made the transition from being a salesperson to being paid to do comedy. So I was like, I don't give. And I didn't know about agents. I didn't know how any mm. of this stuff worked. I didn't know what part of this the industry this was. Like, to me, an agent was a guy in America who's in the suit with a cigar goes, Harry, Kurt, I see a lot of guys. <laughs> And they, I don't know if they got it, but you've got it, Kurt. I thought that's what agent was. I didn't think it was like these other middle class people mm. who a lot of the time want to be comics themselves and mm. just trying to have a career that all but the whole thing was whatever. So I was like, ah, oh, that's fine. Why don't you just be my agent? Because I'm getting paid gigs myself already. I can count. Mm. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the point in like giving somebody money for work that I've made myself. So in terms mm. of like my book or like my gigs, I worked up a healthy amount of gigs. I was... Before I had an agent, I was playing junglers by myself. I was mm. playing like doing paid rooms, like top secret by myself. And mm. this is before people knew what top secret was because before it was at Drury Lane and had mm. two or three floors now, it used to be a small club downstairs on um, King Street in Covent Garden mm. in the Africa Centre. Mm. And so before like mainstream actually cared about that club, I used to play that with other comics all the time. And I said to my manager, look, I'm doing all right. So if TV or people get involved and you can oversee that stuff. So... That's how UTC started. Mm. So if you're aware of UTC as an arts management, it mm. started because I said to my manager, you just manage me. And then one day she, is, she was just like, um, I've quit my job. Mm. And I was like, what? And she was like, I'm going to manage you full time. And I was like, but I live with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have all this money yet. But um, yeah, that's kind of how it started. And so there was this, I guess, this joint objective of wanting to change the landscape of comedy in terms of like, removing power from people who say stuff like we've got one black British act we don't need to and also making the scene much more reflective of the UK mm -hmm. as a uh, in terms of it being a much more of a melting pot of people from different uh, walks of life and uh, I guess after that did the first show in Edinburgh and I think that that's where I kind of transitioned from being a comic and on the, on the come up to being like a I guess having some level of profile mm. so I've well, UTC has some monster comics now, so well done. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. A big, that's the biggest fuck you can because, say Yeah, anyone. because a lot, because a lot, because with UTC, a lot of the comics that you see now, you know, were all very talented in their own right, mm. but the mainstream would not listen to them. And they were also had seen that when they even made attempts to transition, that they weren't that supported. Mm. So when I got nominated for Best Newcomer, it was particularly pivotal to people because it was like, for black acts, it's like, that's an act that we know because we've gigged with him mm. and we know that you don't have to die. Because what normally happened was for a black act to be successful, like people look at Lenny Henry and understand that Lenny Henry is a very good actor and impressionist, mm. but he don't write his material. So he's got mm. Oxbridge guys writing his material, which is not going to relate to black people. Mm. And also then when it's not great, no one ever goes, that comedian's not very funny. Who wrote his material? People mm. don't really, it's just his face that takes all the flack for it. Mm. And what you tend to find with a lot of my predecessors was, if they transitioned to doing mainstream, then they wouldn't play black rooms or they'd have to change their material so much that most people, not just black people, people at large wouldn't be able to relate to it unless you were mm -hmm. someone who was part of understanding this bubble of Mock the Week and Live at the Apollo and the panel show mm -hmm. bubble. Unless they were diehard comedy fans, most people wouldn't really know about it. So when I got nominated, it meant that not just for the black British people, like, oh, you could actually be yourself and be successful. Mm -hmm. It was like all the guys that were on the circuit because circuit comics mm. were very different to Edinburgh comics. Mm. So circuit comics were like, oh, you can actually be a circuit comedian who just plays comedy clubs mm. and be considered a comedian. And so yeah, I think it, it definitely led to a lot of changes because then, I mean, I'd say most of the black British comics of my time all 
either signed with or tried to sign with UTC off the back of that because they were like, well, this is there is a path you can choose now which won't actually take away from what you're doing. So it was uh, very cool to be a, a part of that wave. But you must have been so frustrated to see all this talent and like just agents not picking up. Were you not just like, what is going? It was, it was crazy, but it was. But I, I, that was kind of my observation was like the showmanship and delivery that I saw from people on the circuit mm. was like very different to what I was here in Edinburgh. And then, you know, there was just this weird schism where like Edinburgh Comics, they would do Edinburgh, they might do Melbourne and Sydney, and then they're not working together for the next 11 months of the year. Mm. So I was like, well, that don't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. If you're, if you're good, like uh, if funny is funny. And mm. so it was, yeah, it was, it was very frustrating. And uh, I think it's similar to the frustration now where comics who want to just perform on, on stage and write jokes and perform them are now competing with like, uh, influencers and I suppose social media personalities mm -hmm. where they might be able to produce content which works for about you know 30 seconds or for a mm -hmm. minute for the digital attention span mm -hmm. but to hold somebody in the room for like five minutes is something very different entirely but I was just somebody where I was again just for my experiences in life was like you know fuck this I'm I, I quit it was a mm -hmm. I had so I was like I'm not going to be a part of this or feed into this I'm going to do mm -hmm. it my own way and uh yeah, I think it was good. It just it just provided the doorway for a lot of people like myself to uh, be able to, uh, I guess, conceptualize a much better pathway to success. Mm. I um, did my show at half five in the bunker two uh, at the Pleasance Courtyard mm. at, uh, in 2014. And I would encourage people to look at all of the other acts that have done it in the same room at the same time since, because mm. it was like, if that's where Dane did it, I'm going to do the same. Because... <laughs> Because uh, Larry Dean and Michael Odawale are two people I can name wow. who did it in the same room at the same time and both got nominated for Best Newcomer after that. So it's the room, did <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be. Could be. But someone had to pick that right room. <laughs> someone had to pick that room. <laughs> but you've had that independence in your writing, I guess, because we're always doing these like big topics. I kind of, I suppose, there will probably be things I talk about. And I guess it was because when I, I tried joke writing initially, it wouldn't really work for me. And I guess my my comedy voice was more honed, not by me just saying funny stuff to my friends. Well, people would laugh at that, but where I see more of like the rupturous laughter and stuff like that is that when I'd be talking about something that pissed me off, mm -hmm. then people would be laughing at the way I would articulate it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where my, I guess my comedy voice, that's where the uniqueness comes from is that like, I'm just trying to write things that I think are true to me. And it might be the delivery of it or how I kind of, or the hyperbole that I use mm -hmm. is just where the comedy comes from. And I guess it's just from the whole uh, whole aff uh, affirmation or maximum people are like, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And mm. so these are just things I just say out loud in order to just kind of process things that piss me off. Because mm. um, I guess I'm not somebody who ever wants to, never wanted to develop like a, a superiority complex and have something that I needed. Because you, you could be successful and it can take it out of you and then you'll become quite bitter. And I, and I never wanted to be the guy that if like a new comic is like, oh, then can you shut down? I'm like, fuck that, do you know how famous I am? <laughs> how fucking dare you? You have much... <laughs> Like, you know, <laughs> oh, fucking Donkey Kong, you're fucking Mario. you got to climb these fucking stairs before you catch up. <laughs> so, yeah, I just uh, just wanted to be, just, yeah, just not lose too much semblance of myself throughout comedy and mm -hmm. stuff like that as well. And I just try and be, I'm quite a cerebral person even off stage. Mm -hmm. And I find it very hard to lie to myself. So I guess all of my endeavors have been to just try and produce the most honest version of myself. Because I feel like I'm never going to be lost for inspiration mm. if I'm, you know, projected a true for, true version of self. And were you not getting pressured by like other comics or producers or anything to be like, why don't you just do more? No, do you know what? I never get, I never really get told in earnest, like there's been people behind my back who've mm. been like, if he smiled more, he would probably do a lot better. But then normally I look at them and be like, well, I don't think your version of success <laughs> is kind of what I want. <laughs> and also for me, it's like, no one could really tell me what success was because there wasn't a precedent to say, if Dane, if you do this, you can be like this guy. Because I look at this guy and be like, well, I'm not like him. So mm. I don't want to be like him. So a lot of the time they'd be like, oh, maybe write your sitcom this way. And, you know, if you're a lot more like Josh Widdicom, people were like, I'm like how the fuck am I going to be like Josh Widdicom? <laughs> you couldn't be two people further on the aesthetic spectrum. <laughs> Josh you are, friend, you yeah. the on opposite ends like don't get me wrong he's Josh Willicum is very yes, funny really, yeah. but the reason he is funny is very different to the reason I'm funny <laughs> and there might be some intersectionality there but yeah. also there was already a Josh Willicum so why do you need two mm. is my logic so I just I just um, I guess the main thing for me was that people would may offer advice of what they think would work but because 
I hadn't seen anybody be able to manifest that same success based on their own recommendations. I was like, well, it's fine. But I was just a lot of time doing something that other people weren't doing. So where does this like artistic side come from? Like I will do what I want and you will. It's a good question. And I feel like it's not a sentiment shared by everyone. Mm. There's a lot of people, as I'm sure you've seen it, who will profess to have certain principles or ideology. And if someone goes, here's some money and you get to be on this TV show, <laughs> there we go, women who, <laughs> women who, <laughs> let me take this wig off. Damn yeah, right, I'm a cisgender man. <laughs> Let's get on. Like, I, for, for me, it's mainly because I never thought I'd be able to do this for a living. Mm. It's just something I just enjoyed doing. So mm. I can't, the way, it's like, if you were told at birth, your son will never walk. And one day he just gets out and starts walking. Like you would use every opportunity you could to like mm. walk, stride, run, jog, mm. sprint, because you just have a new lease of life. And for me, that's just how I see comedy. Like I was happy and was under the impression I would be doing a normal job, normal family, and just live a banal ass life. And so a lot of happenstance that ended up in me being able to do what I want for a living. Like I just embrace it fully. Like I have fucking shitty days. And curse, <laughs> like everybody does and I fucking curse this industry and I curse the people in this industry and the gatekeepers and I will throw proverbial rocks at them but every day and I heard another there's a grime artist called Novelist and I remember him saying I wake up every day and I do what I want and for me that is what I'm chasing I just think it's just the most I think that uh, art is really uh, the it's the only real thing humans have that gives us distinction from other animals or other uh, life. Uh, it's the only true, I think we can chronicle our existence. And uh, yeah, I just think, I just, that's, none, that's a thing, that's an understanding that I feel like I have about our human experience. And uh, I just embrace it with uh, everything I can because, you know, even, especially with comedy, like being there, being able to stand up in a room and say what you think. Mm -hmm. Not many people get to do that. And mm -hmm. even if they do, it's normally, they're either lying or they're trying to please some kind of corporate entity mm. or they're conforming to other stuff. Most people do not enjoy the privilege of just saying what they think. Even when people, even the people, people that say free speech are paying for Twitter. That's how dumb they are. <laughs> <laughs> free speech. You're paying for the speech. Is this okay? Alan? Yeah. <laughs> Twitter blue. But it's like, so it's, for me, it's, I just think it's just a massive human gift that, uh, you know, I just prize about everything else. And and just also because, I, but it's just more, I think it's just more about, I guess part of my procrastination journey before I did comedy was mm. looking at people that I admired. And I found it very hard to find an artist or a performer who didn't also have their principles or their disposition feed into their art mm. and vice versa. Like, you know, Bruce Lee just wasn't like an amazing martial artist. He was someone who, before Bruce Lee was in the States, like they only did some karate and judo. And then he opened up this whole new world mm. and bridged this gap between like Hong Kong cinema and like the West. And, you know, I looked at someone like Chuck D and it's like, you were able to, you know, introduce like, he says he says that hip hop is uh, African American CNN. So again, you are hoping to open up the whole world. So now when people say don't believe the hype, mm. they don't even think it's from public enemy. They don't even, they don't remember mm. it, but that's, you've been able in, to enter into like common vernacular in the same way that like, if someone's a, a mad fan, you call them Stan mm. from Eminem. So for me, it's like, I guess I'm always trying to chase that way where it's like you can imp I think art is a way you can imprint on culture mm. and you know, have people and leave your mark on people that doesn't involve money. And I don't think anything lasts when you use money to do it, I don't think anything lasts. And I think that's the craziest thing about most billionaires is that somewhere inside, they know that. Mm. That's why they do all the magic they do to prolong their lives because they know that really most of us on a superficial basis are all equal in death. And the only way you're able to uh, really subvert that is how you imprint on other people. Mm. And it's about, and then, but then on the same point, because infamy and fame are two fingers on the same hand, is what you want your idea or what the ideation of you to represent. There are some people where it's like, when people think of you, they think what a fucking prick and it's about what you want. But then at the same time, no one's loved universally and hated universally. Mm. So I guess, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to capture the human experience best I can, man, and mm. just live this shit because I, cause I'd spent so much of my time being like, I'm just going to have a regular ass life. Mm. 
So and this is not that regular and it's not always great, but uh, it's definitely, it's my choice. Hmm. And I've made it so fucking long for you, Reese. But essentially, no, no, not at all. I say with people, and uh, my advice to comedians when you're doing it is that even if it doesn't go the way you want to, you're never going to be sitting at your desk or wherever having an existential crisis being like, what if I had? Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that is important, an important uh, bit of soothing mm -hmm. that all humans can do for their mental health. Because mm -hmm. I also never wanted to be that guy to my kids being like, given, you know, the Raging Bull speech, I could have been someone too, you know, <laughs> but you're a fucking fertile <laughs> mum. That's why I'm not where I, I could have been right there. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just, um, yeah, just... Just enjoy doing something I, I love, man. I, I don't think that I, I'm quite, I think it's, it's human life is a very, it can be, especially how we live. Mm. If you don't have to deal with the day to day of just trying to feed and clothe yourself and keep, keep yourself fed and watered and mm. have shelter, then you're a lucky person. And so I'm just trying to embrace the gifts that I've been given really. So did it take you to get to the point where comedy was covering the basic necessities before you were like, okay, I'm true to myself? Or were you always? Uh, no, I think I was always that way because I just think it was because it was, I'd already seen that money alone won't make you happy. Mm. And so, and I guess I wanted to make some promises to myself before I did comedy in earnest where it was like, don't think about a number. Mm. Because I think if I look at like your con contemporaries in music, for example, I remember like if I was a rapper, for example, or rappers in general, there was a time when going gold mm. as a rapper was amazing. Mm. But then some people went platinum. So then, then the goalposts moved. Does it mean that the people that went gold contributed less? Not necessarily. Mm. Just that times change. And, you know, it's a, I guess it's about realizing that you're a brick in the wall more than anything. So I guess I, um, yeah, I just, I just, I just, I guess I always just, I think it's good for you mentally, man. Mm. I just think it's just good for you mentally and stuff as well. I just think there's a, uh, you will deal with a lot of shit that will make you go, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> and a lot of it will be external as well. Mm. How many, like, you have a list of things that when you tell people you do stand-up comedy, that like, the responses alone, like, you're mm. just like, uh, you, 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 you're, I know why people shoot up school sometimes. Like, that's, <laughs> that's how much, that's how much of a prick people are. Like, mm. for me, comedy is up there for me with boxing or becoming a professional footballer. In mm. that, Everyone has an opinion on it. Mm. Everyone thinks they can do it. Everyone, amongst their friends, everyone's a baller. Everyone can throw a punch. Mm. But in the same way that being funny and performing comedy are two different things, throwing a punch and boxing are two very different things. Mm. And, and, and they are the two, for me, they're almost the two uh, sub-genres of their respective the sport or the art form where comedy at its base level, no one gives a fuck about you or your feelings. <laughs> They don't respect you and you got to do it in pubs on a weekday. <laughs> do you know who's in a pub on a weekday at 10 o'clock? Alcoholics. <laughs> alcoholics, Reese. And I thank those alcoholics because they were there. But really, in the same way that those are the people that are also there at your early fights, your boxer, amateur fights. It's drink, it's criminals and, and alcoholics that are mainly there. And you got to work towards getting to the, you get to these high echelons there's very few people that can do this job, but it is a real climb. And so, yeah, you just have to, I just respect everyone that does it. And uh, yeah, it, it can be very tough. But by that same token, you have to have some part of yourself and decide what your own goals are because the goalposts will always move. There'll be mm. always be someone doing perceive what you might perceive is better than you on paper, for example. Mm. The only thing you can control is your emotional reaction to these things and how you deal with certain things. Mm. And so... There might be people watching being like, yeah, he's just saying that because he's poor. Well, do you know what? Alexander McQueen had a shitload of money mm. and he lost his mum and that was enough. There was no amount that, you know, you were the, you were the high, in the height of fashion and hawk couture and you're respected, but having somebody you love not being around meant that he couldn't manage it. And I don't take mm. anything away from him. I completely understand that sentiment in the same way that, same thing with Kate Spade. Mm. So I say that because trust me, if you make money for long enough, then you can become numb to that as well. Mm. And it's like, when you look at uh, rappers, again, for example, who brag about their money, if you already got the money and you're making so much money, you know what the dumb thing is to do? Take a record deal. Because mm. they steal your money. Or they mm. take 85%, you take 15 mm. So anyone who's a savvy business person would know it's not a good deal to make. Mm. There's obviously something in these people esoterically where they need to be validated by telling people about their achievements. Mm. So, and the money doesn't do it for them. 
Like, you know, I look at people like Paul Sinner or Felix Dexter. Paul Sinner was a doctor. Michael Akadiri was a doctor. Uh, Felix Dexter was a, was a trader solicitor. Mm. You know, these are considered professions which are at the height of culture mm. or of our culture or society. But clearly there's something else in these men who are obviously very clearly studious, intelligent people, mm. which they get from comedy and maybe allows them to really speak about the true intellectual truths or display their wit in a way that the jobs don't allow them to. There's something special about that. Mm. And, you know, I just feel like comedy is also, it's the honest form of politics mm. that if you do it properly, you can definitely change minds of people. Mm. So I actually think it's the only way someone can change my mind. And yeah. I don't know if that's maybe an ignorant or right. Not at all. But... That's because that's how it works. Most mm. people use jokes as an icebreaker. Mm. How many times have you seen people like shitting themselves over doing like a speech for as a maid of honor or a speech as a best man? Mm. It's like, oh, I need to make it funny at first and blah, blah, because they know laughter is a universal language and it mm. allow it can disarm people in order for you to get your point across. And so being able to do that very well, um, it's a massive amount of power. Mm. Uh, it's just how you kind of use that. And I guess that's the other thing as well, is that like, I tell myself that once you're in certain positions, you're going to have to have the right uh, mindset. So that's our reason. I guess I didn't necessarily know what it was going to be, but being an artist and, and uh, having respect for yourself and what you do is important, especially in the era of social media, mm. where a complete random can mm. say, you're fucking shit and I'll mm. knock you out. And you, you'd never see who this person is. Mm. And so, yeah, you need to be able to control those emotions. Mm -hmm. Where does all this philosophy come to? And you're just constantly reading Marcus Aurelius, what's going on? I just, I just, think, <laughs> I just think it's a natural, it's the natural progression mm. of comedy because comedy, most of us, most of us do observations mm. and observations really for most human beings, your ability to observe is basically limited to your five senses. Mm. And then the part is that most of us, our observations start as superficial, which is why when you go on, when most people go on stage at open mic level, you'll hear them say, I know what you're thinking. Mm. And the reason why is because they're aware that most people make their judgments on you based on their first perception of you. Mm. So then your show, most open mic, how the fuck do I start the show? Or what's my opening joke going to be? Mm. And some people make a big effort. I saw a guy go on stage with a delivery thing the other day. <laughs> He had like a Deliveroo a thing and he had a, a box like, did someone order Deliveroo? And obviously it's like, it's pertinent to today, but I don't think you want to do that for the rest of your life. You don't want to be on tour bringing on a Deliveroo box all the time, but if that's the way he wants to do it. Mm. I think it's cool. I want to make mm. sure that's clear as well. Yeah. It's all subjective. But it shows you that we're all just trying to give ourselves distinction when we go on stage. And I say that because then we talk, observational comedy is like talking about stuff on a skin and the surface level. Mm. But I think then for most of us, we're trying to scratch beneath the surface to find out what everybody makes everyone tick. Because mm. that's how as a comic, you'll be able to engage with everybody is that mm. people always go, you didn't say what I was thinking. <laughs> that's why that was really funny. Because I don't, I think it, but I don't want to say it. But you said it. And I really... <laughs> that's all, so we're all trying to chase something that is kind of mm. metaphysical anyway. So I think the natural progression then is philosophy where it's like, we've now gone past the five senses and what make, how many people think. And now we're just trying to, capture and understand human consciousness. Mm. So that's why stuff gets, I think it gets a bit more philosophical because it's a, I suppose like the large part of comedy and how you try to grow as an artist is working out the, the who and the what. Uh, and I'm just trying to get to that stage where I'm just trying to find out the why mm. and the how. And I think uh, that, yeah, once it, the more it becomes philosophical, I think that's when you kind of in that space where you're like really starting to get scratched beneath, beneath mm. the surface. Because especially now where comedy, everything's like political identity and how you, how you kind of, uh, what tribe you align yourself with, which is a strange thing because you think with this digital media and the democratization of media, we would be able to find more instances of what uh, links us all as people. Mm. But as you've seen, because we've never really, people have never really experienced democracy before. Mm. People only experience democracy in, in politics, but even then, if you're under 18, then you don't get to experience that. Mm. So it's the first time I'm experiencing democracy. And instead of people talking about what brings us together, you can see that there's an insecurity there where now everyone's talking about what makes them different to everybody else. Because mm. everyone's so scared of losing themselves in a sea of voices mm. and not being a part of more of an aristocracy. So we're like, well, I identify as this, I identify as that. And as someone who is 40 and been doing comedy and seeing some of these new trends, it's like, yeah, but we all, thematically, most of our lives are the same. Mm. Doesn't matter what you got between your legs. You're worried, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You worry mm. about, you're, you're gonna worry about being loved. You're gonna worry about 
your experiences of love. You're going to recount your trauma in both of those aforementioned things. You're going to maybe worry about money, depending on where you come from. But everyone is driven by the same things. And so mm. I think comedy is about trying to tap into that. And you bring everyone together as well to explore. Yeah, so it's, actually... it's, it's about, it's about, um, that's the thing. It's like, but you can only, do, but the best way to do that as a human being is always by example. Mm. So it's like, this is the, let me show you the darker recesses of my mind and how that works. Mm. Uh, which might, uh, which normally gives people the courage to understand, understand or accept their own. Mm. But doing all of that uh, with the uh, context of laughter makes that whole process much easier. Mm. That's why you know, comments like, oh, this is like therapy for me. But like, therapy is much more boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more boring. Well, this is a very selfish question on my part, but mm -hmm. I'm trying to explore like the like the bad thoughts that I'll have. Like, so yeah. for example, I'll think like, oh, I, I'll take an example. It's a horrible example, but my brain will be like, oh, you should cheat. When I know I shouldn't, but I'll say that and I'll get a laugh, like the the ideation of it. Yeah. And then the other comics will come up to me and be like, oh, you shouldn't say that. And I'm going through this constant. I don't know if it's just this where we are in the cycle, but it's yeah. really starting to like get to me. I'm like, because I, I want to be like, I'm a flawed person. <laughs> Which is it. Yeah. That's exactly it. And yeah. and in my experience, the people that act as if they don't have flaws are normally the most corrupt, mm -hmm. most depraved people out there. And to deny that people have these inclinations, you are limiting yourself or hamstringing yourself artistically as well as uh, psychologically. Mm. Like shutting off parts of your brain, I believe. That's why you got people in their stupors having dementia and shit like, and degenerative diseases because mm. their minds have had to donate, do donate so much energy and creative energy to, you know, shutting off these thoughts mm. or negating these thoughts or not taking accountability for stuff or not acknowledging trauma that it manifests in other ways. Mm. It's like, since I've done comedy, I find it much harder to refer to somebody as crazy. Mm. Like we'd use like colloquial terms like that person's crazy, that person's tapped, that person's gone. But it's like now when I see somebody who may have had developmental disorder and it looks like they're talking to themselves, as a comic, that don't look crazy to me. Yeah. Working it out. <laughs> working, they're just working out. They're just working out. It, it, they may have had a trauma mm. as a child and what they couldn't say to the person that was responsible for that at the time, they're saying now. Mm. And that's how they learn to process it. Mm. As a comedian, I and to most people, I definitely suggest taking that walk inside of your own head. Because mm. that's your fucking head. Mm. These comedians can tell you whatever. Nobody else, because for me, I guess with, with comedy, I guess I always try to, and even with my podcast, I'm always trying to capture people with these two points just before they go to sleep and where they, just when they wake up. Because I believe there is this small, even if it's a nanosecond where just before you go to sleep or just before you wake up from a dream, mm -hmm. you don't think about your race, gender, sexual orientation. You are a consciousness having an experience. Mm -hmm. When you wake up, there is a nanosecond where you wake up, maybe from a dream, you don't think about your dream as a man, your nationality, anything like that, because you don't necessarily think of those things in a dream. You're just having a consciousness that's having an experience. And for me, those are the two points where human beings are probably more connected with each other than any other time. Mm -hmm. So the more I can talk about those experiences, the better. For me, it's, it's fine to show you're a flawed individual because it's also not just for you. We're a social species. You mm -hmm. taking that walk means that somebody else doesn't necessarily have to do that or someone else is negating these feelings. Mm -hmm. And also... As soon as you start not telling all of the story, you're beginning to lie to yourself mm. and then you're going to feel like you struggle anyway. So, and at the end of the day, I believe, despite what you hear the comics talk about freedom of speech and blah, 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 as soon as you start centering yourself in your own head, mm. you're already on the path to beginning like fucking yourself over and depriving yourself. Like you can't deprive yourself of free speech in your own mm. head. Mm. That's your fucking head. Mm. And in the world we live in now where we have so much capitalist surveillance and you know so much biometrics that can measure and move your behavior and stuff, this is probably the only time now, at the point we're at now, mm. where what's in your mind still gets to be yours. Because mm. they're asking for it already. Mm. You go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, what's the first thing they ask you? Yeah. What's on your mind? Mm. You don't even tell a person that shit. If you can't <laughs> tell a person that shit, why are you gonna tell a machine? Mm. And not just a machine, that machine has people working on the other end mm. who you're giving your innermost thoughts to. And the problem with that as well is that human beings were getting into this practice of giving our ghosts to the machine. And by that, I mean, like I said, for me, that feeling of being like, fuck this, I quit. Mm. You see, once you can quit one job, no one can hold you for nothing. Mm. You'll be able to, anytime you're not enjoying yourself, you're like, ah, fuck this. Mm. People don't know how to handle it because mm. it's very rarely that someone say, I'm not doing this mm. and, and just walking away. 
Because most people are able to dangle money or dangle stuff mm. over you. If you are not resistant, people can't control you. Mm. And it's the same thing, with, I think, with comes to as ready is that if you start introducing controls into your own head, mm. you're going to struggle. Because it, and it doesn't just mean I'm saying, oh, so you can just say racist or sexist stuff and blah, blah. Mm. If you're going to say that, let's complete the journey and mm. talk about why you have that statement. Mm. If you can, you can make a statement what you want, but then to make that statement and then well, that's just how I feel. Well, again, and even in that respect, as a comic, mm. you're not really doing yourself justice because mm. people want to know, see you're working and how did you arrive at that point? Because then what happens is at least when people do laugh, they'll be like, I don't agree with what you're, you're saying, mm. but I respect the fact that you made, you, I respect the journey you've got to that point. Because mm. everyone has periods in their, like being a troll, we all have that experience. Mm. So we can all understand it. When I'm driving, fuck, like if you heard the stuff <laughs> I said I was driving, I definitely wouldn't have a career. Mm. I'd be I'd be cancelled. <laughs> if I if I if I'm driving and I haven't been eat and I haven't eaten. Oh man, <laughs> I've been doing chairman mal numbers. I'm fucking telling you. <laughs> uh, what's the worst piece of advice you hear comedians being told? Um, I think it's the same you've been told. Mm. Is that people being like regular people be like, oh, I just wish you wouldn't talk about this stuff. I wouldn't talk about that stuff. I'm sorry. Why didn't you say anything when I wrote it in the first place? That's right. <laughs> you weren't fucking there. <laughs> and since you weren't fucking there. I'm not taking your input now, mm. okay? You weren't there to fucking mill the wheat, bring in the sheaths, bake the bread. So mm. eat this toast or don't eat mm. this fucking toast. Mm. But you don't get, to, it's like I say, like, you know, if you don't like a f comedy, yeah, and as it appears on the lineup, it's like a buffet in it of food for four. Mm. So you go for a buffet. I don't take, I don't like this dish. I like this dish. Mm. You build your own plate to mm. consume. If you don't like the plate, you just leave it and go into the next one. You don't go in the kitchen and be like, shut this whole kitchen down. I don't know what's going on it. <laughs> Fuck off. No one's forcing you to listen to this shit. Mm. So yeah, it's normally the, the, the worst information, uh, the worst advice I normally receive is people telling me how to be myself. Mm. So, And how do you do that journey of like introspection? Are you just writing stuff down if you have a thought or like? Sometimes, sometimes I think it's introspection. I think everyone has a different process. Mm. So sometimes you'll hear other comments and be like, I spent all day writing. And you'll be like, I don't <laughs> fucking do that. What's wrong with me? <laughs> And also, no one does that. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody does that. 12 minutes. Yeah. If, 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 anyone, if anyone sits with you writing all day, they're getting paid a good bit of money. <laughs> for, and it's normally for somebody else. Yeah. It's only if you're being paid to. But I just think everyone has a different process. And what I would say is, uh, you know, if something grabs you or you think of something particularly poignant, just write it down. Even if it's like, I write like a shitload of notes on, like, on my phone mm. and stuff. And sometimes it may not make sense. Mm. Or sometimes it might take a bit longer for me to work it out and how I can make that funny. But um, yeah, I normally just write stuff down or maybe an idea will kind of be in my head and I'll share that with like, you know, friends and partners, stuff like that and concepts and just see how it works. And I was taught when I did this comedy course by another comedian called Mr. C, who's a great, been a great mentor. He was like, you can bank stuff and you can bin stuff. So mm -hmm. if it don't work and it never works, then probably bin it. But you can bank something where it's like, even if it's just a line mm -hmm. and that line's still premature, too premature to like go on stage with you can just keep working it and working away at it and most of the questions that come with a comedy and like how to do this and what happens with this they are everyone will always have their own nuanced experience mm. but overall experience is the best teacher with comedy there's no better one because i'm sure because people go comedy what do you do if somebody heckles <laughs> Well, the same way that if I was having a conversation with you mm. and I heard someone else say something, it's the same thing. If it, if it's not worth addressing and they're walking past, I would just carry on. The same way mm. if a, a heckle doesn't dis, dis, uh, disrupt the show, mm. I'll just carry on. If it is disrupting the show, I might address it. Mm. But, you know, most hecklers are not that brave and it doesn't really require much at the end of the day. But I'd say, yeah, for... My process is normally just thinking of stuff. So, and through experience, I've learned that some stuff I can be like, yeah, that's going to work. Mm. And then other stuff, like I did a joke recently about The Little Mermaid. It has not gone well. <laughs> <laughs> it has not gone well. And it's not there yet. <laughs> but there's enough of a premise that if I work it, mm. I'm sure it will be funny. But it might even try and inspire that I'm not the person to tell that joke. Mm. Because I'm also in my 40s. And why do I need to have an opinion on this <laughs> film anyway? I don't. So... <laughs> When it's not going well, do you just do you just revert back? What's the gear you switch um, into, or do you just depending on? It? I, I I think acknowledging it is the best mm. part. If I'm on stage and it don't work, I'd be like, yeah, well, work. <laughs> we tried, yeah, we tried, <laughs> we tried. If 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 you get turbulence on a flight, 
<laughs> and the pilot was like, this flight is going great. You'd be like, this is not shit. <laughs> Saying this. I don't trust him. That's when you get more worried. Yeah, like, you get oh. more worried. Yeah, and you, you, you've probably seen comics. Where you're like, does he not know this is not going well? Smart to guess. Yeah. And there's some people like that. You've probably seen it yourself. You're like, can be even sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you got to power through. But yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I just think it's it's about. Like I said it's about being honest and. A lot of uh, audience members are along for that ride. Mm. They want to be a part of that creative process because mm. comedy is almost like you're trying to uh, emulate conversation. And in the same way, if you have a conversation, you might be like, Do you know what? I'm actually just like, <laughs> I said that, but I also had too much weed before I said that. <laughs> and people will understand it. Think of, people people are much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I probably should have said that shit. <laughs> my ex pissed me off today. <laughs> people laugh a lot from that kind of honesty. I think that's what mm. works the, the best. And I, I just think it's a. Uh, that's the thing. People. If people want to be told what they want to hear, then they need to go speak to a politician. Mm. If you want to hear the truth, then that's what comedy is for. So if you had to form a super comedian from three comedians and you can steal like one thing from each of them, yes. what would you, who would you combine? That's a really good question, actually. Um, I guess I would go for a combination of Bill Hicks, because I guess I do aspire mm. to have that philosophical aspect of my work. Um Dave Chappelle, who I think is on the trajectory to transcending into uh, comedy and philosophy at the same time. And, hmm, uh, do you know who I like lately? Abby Wong. Because mm. oh, I feel like she's so, so funny, so talented. And I saw Beef quite recently, mm. only like a couple months ago. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> it's it's, it's, so, it's so, so good. good. It's, it's so good because it's, it's good because it's funny, mm. but it's not trying, I don't think it's trying to push for like slapstick funny, even though there are slapstick moments in it. Mm. And I think, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how much experience she has, but I just think as, as an actress, the transition mm. and the range that she showed, amazing. Mm. Um, I think it's always good where there is a relatable archetype, which you sometimes find quite rare in like drama or dramedy mm. or whatever it is doing. But um and also, I just think Abby is, Wong is coming from a perspective which we've not seen in comedy for a little while. Mm. So maybe those three would be my uh, Frankenstein of comedy. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. Dude. Thank you for having me, man. I feel like I've talked your ear off and just been rambling. Uh, so sorry to the... No, that was the most cool shit. hearing thing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I'm I didn't tell you at the time, but I had been fired recently so you're preaching to the choir because i was like oh this is all this is awful i've always worked in startups so i was like yeah i might have been a bit dangerous this interview at this exact time because i'm feeling very pumped but <laughs> no, <laughs> no, for it. Act, act on it fuck them <laughs> fuck them fuck them and the, yeah. the specials out this week yeah uh so this well no this week i'm gonna be doing previews oh, oh, but okay, i have a special so i did i did a show called the chocolate chip which was uh before the pandemic hit uh and then finished doing a few shows after the pandemic but uh my show, The Chocolate Chip, is out on the 4th of August. It'll be available on YouTube in conjunction with 800 Pound Gorilla. So if you follow 800 Pound Gorilla, look it out for it there. Or, um, yeah, find me online uh, for more information and updates. But, um, yeah, I hope people check it out. I hope you will enjoy it. I think that you will. And uh, if you're going to Edinburgh, then you can catch me on the Free Fringe. I'm doing Monkey Barrel uh, at 4.15 at the Hive One. And my show is called Bap Squire. So come and check it out if you are... A regular comedian that likes jokes. There will be no, 40, <laughs> there will be no, there will be no shit at forty minutes. There will be no gimmicks or bells and whistles. I'd just be saying funny shit for uh, fifty minutes or some change. So come and check it out, please. And thank you for having me. No problem at all. Yeah, uh, if you've enjoyed the episode, uh, give it a a like on Apple Podcast or Spotify. And um, we'll post in reels and stuff on Kin. So follow Kin Podcast for more information. And I'm going to see your show, so you'll probably see me there as well. And I'll be dying laughing. So Let's thank you so much. After of and course, maybe so. a spliff when it's legal. <laughs> When it's legal. <laughs> or when it's not legal. I go fuck. And you got bigger fish to fry. Thank you. You'll see me coughing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Cheers, dude. No, thank, thank you, you man.